Good morning, everybody. Happy Tuesday. Hopefully everyone's doing well. Uh, if you can give me some green check marks, please, and we'll get going. Uh, really happy to, uh, to have the midterm out of the way and very impressed with your guys' marks overall. Kind of fading into the background here. Let's just move on. That's better. There I am. Um, very impressed with the, the marks overall. Everyone did quite well. And um, I think with maybe one or two exceptions, everyone was kind of where I felt they should be. Uh, so hopefully you weren't terribly disappointed with your mark, but you know, everything on there looked uh, pretty good. Is uh, I had the, the grades up on the Thursday, and if you haven't checked them, I think it's in unit three, the actual assignment, but if you just go to your grades, they should all appear there. Um, so yeah, they're, they're all up there, Taylor. Just go to your grades page. It says midterm exam, and um, the marks are all up. So everyone did uh, fairly well, which was great. Um, how did you feel about the, uh, the exam? Did you guys feel okay with it, or was it kind of like stressful, or um, how did you guys think it was? Was it good? Was it bad? Something you didn't expect on it? Everything you kind of thought was going to be there ended up being there? Interested to uh, hear your guys' thoughts on it. Good. I can handle good. Um, the, the unit four learning guide, uh, we weren't really... I said either today or tomorrow it would be due. So um, I'm going to stick with that. So if the Unit 4 Learning Guide, it was a long one. Um, you can get that one in today or tomorrow. That would be great. The kind of cutoff for the report card would be uh, normally kind of today. I think Mrs. Wood might have put in yesterday as well. Um, so I'm not going to include the unit four learning guide on the midterm or the your th third term um, grade. So the unit four learning guide, a, a few of you have submitted it. You know, Anna gave you uh, gave it to me at uh, the midterm. So if you've submitted the unit four learning guide, I'm going to take your marks and then I will mark the unit four learning guide after. So the unit four will actually be part of term four. Uh, so, Abby, I did get your message, and that's fine. Uh, so, yeah, if if you want to drop the learning guide off because it, it would be a lot of pictures to take, that's fine. Uh, I don't have an issue with that. Just come in. Uh, if I should be here, but if I'm not or if I'm teaching or something, just slide it under my door or just give it to somebody else and then give it to me. That's, that's completely fine. Um, but I would like it in the next couple of days. It won't be on this report card. It'll be on the next one. But I do want to get that marked for you guys. Uh, the other thing, well, that's good. Um, the other grading item is, I guess the midterm will kind of be the last, uh, last assignment that's on there. Now, there was a few assignments in chapters two, uh, unit two, I should say. We had a nutrient cycle, a uh, little write-up. And then in unit three, we had the adapted squirrel project. And then unit 10, we had the plate tectonics worksheet. So some of you submitted them with the learning guides for those units. Some of you submitted them actually right into the assignment where the handout was. So I'm pretty sure I've marked them all, but if you for some reason have a zero for one of those assignments, then please let me know and I can go in and mark it if you submitted it. Uh, so some of you might have submitted it with the learning guide and I just didn't you know put two and two together and I you might have handed it in but I didn't mark it and put it in that other spot so if that's the case uh, for units two three or ten the assignments that were part of those you just want to send me a message say hey Mr. Borden I submitted the play tectonics document with my learning guide but I don't have a mark for it or something like that and that way I can go in and uh, mark that for you so Basically, if you check your grade right now and you have everything submitted, that's going to be your term three uh, letter grade. 
And if you have um, something outstanding, then yeah, I mean, I can mark it and get it in and we can go from there. Uh, we are going to jump into uh, Unit 6 today. So I tried to give some of you guys the Unit 6 Learning Guide when we wrote the midterm. Uh, some of you took one, some of you forgot. So anyways, we're doing Unit 6 because it is more uh, balancing, it's more types of reactions, so really similar to what we've been doing. And Unit 5 kind of doesn't really fit in super well with it, so we'll do Unit 5 after. So I think that's it for kind of housekeeping. Does anybody have any questions about the term through report card, where we're at, anything like that? Um, if not, I'll just continue on into Unit 6 here, and we'll go from there. All right, so Unit 6 is about types of reactions and how to speed up and slow down reactions. So it's only two sections. Really short, we might be able to get through it all today, but I, I don't really care if it takes us uh, the rest of the week or two days. Um, but it is kind of a really quick one, and then it's done. So very similar to unit uh, four that we just finished. And one thing that I did notice that I was maybe a bit disappointed on was the, the last two pages of the midterm with the kind of written questions where you had to form your compounds. So most of you guys did a pretty good job of it, but I was kind of disappointed with the amount of people who um, didn't just get 100% on that stuff. Uh, so most of you did, you know, you did fine on it, no big issues, but you're still making really small mistakes here and there. And unfortunately, those little mistakes will add up. And when you start seeing the things we're going to cover today, the stuff you learned in unit four continues on into unit five and six and we're of course do unit six today and um, it's uh, it's really important that you have a good grasp of it so I was trying to drill it into you guys to get you guys really good with the covalence and polyatomics and ionics and multivalence all the different types of compounds remembering the rules for them how to form them the names of them things like that um, but some of you kind of were still making little mistakes here and there. And unfortunately with the chemistry, it kind of just all adds together until you get to this unit six. And if you're making little mistakes along the way, when you get to this stuff, it uh, is really going to be obvious that you're having issues. So uh, Abby or everyone else, if you are interested in looking at your midterm exam, uh, we can arrange that for sure. So just send me a message and... Uh, if you can come in to look at it, that'd be great. But if you absolutely can't come in, then I guess I could send... Oh, uh, well, it's fine. Um, if you want me to just scan it and send it to you, I, I can do that for sure. So there you go. Um, perfect. You too, I can do that. Anyone else that's interested, I will do that as well. If you want to come in and talk about what you got right or wrong, then uh, I'd be happy to go through the test with you question by question, just so you're kind of aware of where you made your mistakes. All right, so I'm just going to go back real quick. I'll disappear here for a second. Ooh, types of chemical reactions this is unit 6.1, and we're going to get going on this. So basically, there's different ways we can classify chemical reactions. And depending on what we're starting with or what we're ending with, we can um, use the uh, sort of different types of reactions to kind of form rules. And then we're able to predict what the reactants are, or predict what the products are going to be, just based on what you're either starting or finishing with. And then we can classify reactions um, based on you know, what sort of things are there. So basically, you're going to look at a bunch of different types of reactions. You're going to be able to identify the, the actual type of reaction. And uh, it, the reactions aren't looking any different than what we've been dealing with thus far, but we just have names for them now. So. The first type of reaction is called a synthesis reaction. And um, a synth synthesis reaction takes two or more things and combines them together to form a compound. So basically your reactants are going to be two things. A and B is just kind of placeholders here. And these two things are going to react to form a compound. So nothing um, too magical about this. And the word synthesis, you might be familiar with 
um, in sort of everyday language, if something is synthesized or if you're using a synthesizer, you're taking a bunch of inputs or a bunch of things and combining them together. So that's what's going on here. So some examples, uh, sodium metal and chlorine gas, if you were to combine those together, they would form sodium chloride, which is uh, a compound. And magnesium metal reacts with oxygen gas to form magnesium oxide. So you're starting with two individual compounds and they're forming, or two individual elements, I should say, and they're combining together to form a compound. That is a synthesis reaction. So we can give you a word equation, we can give you, um, we can give you uh, the symbols, and you should be able to predict what's going to happen. That's kind of the goal here. So here's a, a handy little chart to help you remember. This isn't in your notes, this isn't in the course, but it is right here in front of you. Um, just kind of wrap your brain around what's going on. So some different ways to think about what's happening here. So you take uh, two or more things combined to form one product, or you can think of an A and a B combined together to give you AB, or you can think of this little girl in the blue dress and little boy, it's red, and they combine together to form a couple. So if, you, if that makes more sense, you go with that. Or if you like shapes, a uh, square plus a circle gives you a square circle. Um, those are all of the different sort of analogies, I suppose, that we can use to describe a synthesis reaction. So try to remember one that works the best for you, and we'll go from there. Here's what the examples for this sort of, uh, these types of questions are going to look like. You can end up with two things to start and then no products, and you're thinking, Mr. Borden, this is really hard. I, how am I going to combine these two things together? I don't know anything about what's going to happen. But the idea here is that you should be able to see the reactants and be able to predict what the products are going to be. So if you are starting out with two individual elements, in this case magnesium and nitrogen, you're going to know that those are combining together to give you a compound, to give you a synthesis type reaction. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump over to my uh, notepad here and we're gonna do the first examples here now in order to get this kind of done in a timely manner I probably won't balance all of these uh, more interested in what products you're gonna form so know that these are unbalanced if we have tons of time left at the end we can go back and balance them all but that's gonna be just a lot of work so more interested in figuring out what the products are going to be so we're looking here uh, these are synthesis, and the examples I don't believe are in your notes. So if you had a separate sheet of paper, you could just copy these down and kind of add it to the notes. So what we need to do is kind of figure out how these things are going to combine together. So we have magnesium and nitrogen are going to combine together to give us a compound, but we don't know what that compound is going to be. But we do know the rules for forming compounds. We know magnesium is Mg, and magnesium always has to charge a plus 2. Nitrogen is N, and nitrogen always has a charge of minus 3. So if I'm going to form a compound with these two elements, I'm going to have to balance them out properly in terms of charge, and I'm going to end up with Mg, 3, N, 2. If you think about crisscrossing your charges down. So that is what we're going to end up with here. How do I know it's going to end up that way? Well, if you think, what else could happen? What other combinations of magnesium and nitrogen are there? When we write a compound, the metals always first, the non-metal second. These can only combine one way. There are two individual elements. What else could we do? Well, there's really no other choices. It's not like one is going to disappear. We know the law of conservation of mass says if we start with magnesium and nitrogen, we need to finish with magnesium and nitrogen. So there's really nothing other, there's no other possible outcomes um, that could happen here. It's just, that's it. That's just what you end with. Uh, we do not need to balance these. We, these are going to just remain unbalanced. Um, but 
for the most part, uh, we would end up balancing them. But just for the sake of time today, I don't want to spend a ton of time going through all these things and balancing them. So these two are the synthesis examples here. So we'll jump down to the, the next one, the aluminum and the fluorine. So again, same idea. I have aluminum by itself. I'm going to add to it fluorine. And what am I going to get? Well, aluminum is Al, always has a charge of plus three, never changes. And then fluorine is F, always has a charge of minus one. So how are these things going to combine together? Well, there's only one possible way that can happen. The fluorine's not going to come first because it's a non-metal, so it always has to come second. The aluminum's the metal, so it goes first. So crisscrossing my charges, if you want to think of it in terms of crisscrossing, that's fine. Aluminum has a charge of plus three and fluorine's minus one, so I'm going to need three fluorines to balance out that reaction um, in terms of making that compound. So typically we'd go through and balance this. We can write our little lines in front of all these things, but again, we're not going to today. So that's what that is going to do in terms of a product. So the first type of reaction, synthesis, if you start with two individual elements, you're going to end up with those forming a compound. All right. The second type of reaction that you need to know is a decomposition reaction. Now, just like we talked about in biology, if something is decomposing or a decomposer, detrivores, they're breaking things down. So we can use the meaning of the word decompose and know that a decomposition reaction is taking something, a compound, and breaking it apart. It's just that simple. So if we started out with just general, the A's and B's are just any element, two elements together, A and B, and you break them apart, you end up with a decomposition reaction. So we start with A, B, we end with A and B where A and B are just elements. We can do this with table salt. Sodium chloride uh, breaks apart to give us, sorry, sodium and chlorine. There we go. Uh, another example, H2O. We can take water, we can add some electricity to it. We can break it into hydrogen and oxygen gas. So the easy way to identify a decomposition reaction is you're starting with one thing. There'll be no plus signs on your reactants side. All right, so analogy time. Uh, one reactant breaks apart to form two products. So we have A and B breaks up into A and B. Or we have NaCl breaks up into Na and Cl. Or we have a couple and they break up. And uh, you can do it with shapes. You have a square and a circle, arrow, circle and square. Just that straightforward. So let's look at a couple examples of this. Again, really easy to see that this is going to be a decomposition reaction because you're only starting with one reactant. Notice there's no plus signs here. Again, we're supposed to predict what's going to happen based on the type of reaction. So if you start with one thing, the only possible thing that could happen is it breaks apart. So there you go. Uh, this was the same as the uh, elephant's toothpaste uh, reaction that I did in class a couple days ago or last day, I suppose, where we took hydrogen peroxide, which is H2O2, and we broke it into hydrogen gas, or sorry, water and oxygen gas. That's a decomposition type reaction. So we only started with one thing and ended up with two. So let's try to predict what's going to happen. We have AU and CL. So what's going to happen here? Well, I'm going to break it apart. AU. And then Cl. Now, this is where it becomes really important to remember, I call them the, the magic seven or the diatomic seven. Now, chlorine, Cl, when it exists by itself, never exists as just Cl. When it's by itself, it's diatomic. So it's really, 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 really important that you have a Cl with a little two next to it. So the two becomes very important. 
because um, because chlorine's one of the diatomic seven or the magic seven or whatever you want to think of them as, if it exists by itself, it needs to have a two next to it. If you forget the two, you imagine trying to balance this thing, uh, you're going to not balance it correctly. So it's just one of these additional things that you need to do. The next one, K2O. Uh, what's going to happen? Well, potassium oxide is going to break apart into potassium, and then I separate my elements, and then oxygen. And again, oxygen is one of the magic seven, the diatomic seven. So when it is by itself, it needs a two. Why did I not put a two next to the potassium? Well, potassium isn't one of the seven. Same thing up above when I did AU or gold. Um, gold wasn't one of the diatomic seven. So when it's by itself, it's just potassium, it's fine. But if it's one of the seven and it's by itself, you need to have the two next to it. It needs to be diatomic. These were examples of decomposition reactions. All right, so synthesis, two individual elements form together to give a compound. Decomposition is the opposite. You start with one thing, they break down into two individual elements. Uh, Taylor, if you look at the, the notes from section, uh, what would it be, 4.3, I guess, the very last slide when we were doing word equations, we talked about the diatomic seven or the, I call them the magic seven. So seven elements, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine, when they're by themselves, they always exist with a two next to them. Um, those are the magic seven. So that was from your notes from last class. All right. Sorry today's class is a bit dry, not a lot happening, just types of reactions. Single replacement. It's kind of what it sounds like. Single replacement. You're replacing something with something that's single. So if you have something by itself, in this case we're using the letter A, just kind of hanging out by itself, and then you have a compound, BC. What's going to happen is the A is going to replace the B in the compound. So it's going to kick the B out and form a compound. So it can happen that the element that's by itself is sometimes a metal, or it can happen that the element by itself is sometimes a non-metal. It doesn't matter. It just basically is the same process. But whatever is by itself is replacing something in the compound. So the way to identify a single replacement type reaction is you're going to have an element and a compound to begin. So your reactants are going to be a compound and an element. Then the element's going to kick one of the things out of the compound. So you can see here the aluminum is going to kick the copper out, and you're going to end up with copper by itself, and then aluminum chloride. And same down below here, the fluorine is going to kick the uh, iodine out, and you're going to iodine by itself, and then NaF. Uh, sometimes students have a difficult time trying to wrap their head around this one because there are some possibilities to deal with. So uh, we'll look at the analogies and then we will discuss a couple examples and see how you guys do. So just in general, you have a compound A and B and then you have an individual element C. It doesn't matter what order these things come in. The C can be in front of the AB or the AB can come first. But what's happening is the C is going to replace the B, so the B is going to be by itself, and then you have AC. So some more examples, and there you have it. I want you guys to try these two examples. So see if you can figure out what's going to happen here. Uh, I suppose we do have a couple choices to make, a couple decisions to make. Uh, in terms of the aluminum, what is the aluminum going to replace in the first example here? Is the aluminum going to replace the, the PB, the lead, or is the aluminum going to replace the chlorine? And Taylor is kind of getting to your question here. How do we know what it's going to replace? Do we know? Does it always kick out the second element? We got to kind of think in terms of a uh, what we know about compounds thus far. 
I'm going to jump over to my little notepad here. So we're looking at these ones right here. These are our single replacement Reactions. Does it replace a metal if it's a metal? And non-metal if it's a non-metal? That makes sense. Can we think of maybe something that uh, would come of that? Uh, Avery, let's take for example the first one we're here doing here. What if the uh, aluminum tried to kick out the chlorine? So we had PB AL. Can anyone see a problem with PBAL? There is a problem here. What kind of rule does this compound, PBAL, violate? Why is it wrong? Why does the aluminum not replace the chlorine? Can anyone think of what could be possibly wrong there? Two metals. You got it, Taylor and Ava and Abby. Yeah, so we have two metals together. Can we ever have two metals that form a compound? No, we can't do that. You can't have two metals forming a compound. It just doesn't work that way. So that possibility doesn't work. Are there any other possibilities? Yeah, there's only one other thing that could happen. So let's do that. Now, one thing that you did, Taylor, when you wrote down... Uh, PBAL plus CL4 is you were thinking, well, I had four chlorines on one side, so I'm going to end up with four chlorines on the other, uh, which is kind of correct, but we need to balance to figure out if that four is going to go there or not. And when we balance, the number goes in front. So we're not balancing today yet. Um, so it's important that when we form the compounds or when something's by itself, we don't put um, anything behind it that we don't really mean. Uh, yeah, Abby, that's a great question. Are we going to end up with covalent type compounds? Generally speaking, no, not in science 10. I don't want to say never, it may happen, but generally speaking, when you're doing a single replacement reaction, you're going to be dealing with um, ionic type compounds, unless they give you something that is, um, they wouldn't though, no. They'll 99.9% they'll .9 of the time be ionic compounds. I'm trying to think of, with covalent, it would be really hard for you to predict because you could end up with CO, CO2, CO3. Uh, you don't know what ratios to use in terms of the covalent compounds, so I'm thinking we probably won't encounter them with, uh, without ionic compounds. So we've decided that the aluminum is going to replace the the lead, because those are metals. Metal replaces metal, non-metal replaces non-metal. All right, so I need to kind of think in terms of my new compound here. Aluminum I know is always plus three, and chlorine is always minus one. So when I form a compound with aluminum and chlorine, I'm gonna end up with AlCl3. And then what happens to the the lead, the PB, well, it just kind of hangs out by itself. Do I need to indicate a charge or anything here? No, I don't. It's not important. I'm not writing down ions. I'm dealing with compounds and elements. So I don't need to write down any charges. I don't need to write down uh, anything else. I'm just happy to leave it like this. And for whatever reason, sometimes students really struggle with the idea of lead being by itself and just being PB. That's it. It's just lead. Just like aluminum here was just AL. There's nothing special about it. If I just had some aluminum foil like I had uh, last class, tin foil. What is it? It's just aluminum. It's not AL2. It's not aluminum combined with anything else. It's just, just AL. That's it. So that's all there is to it. All right. Uh, next example. What's going to happen here? Uh, we're looking down below here. That's not perfectly clear. I'm trying to fit everything on one page. Uh, Na plus Cu2O, what does that produce? 
Taylor, that's right, yeah. We're gonna end up with uh, always a non-metal and a metal together. You don't want two, two metals together, that's not gonna work, and you don't want two non-metals together. Because um, in almost all of these examples, there's gonna be ionic compounds, so metal, non-metal. So you're right there. So this example here, Na plus Cu2O, we have, again, a metal, Na, and the metal is going to replace the metal. So we're going to end up with Na. Taking kick and Cu out. So we know we're going to end up with just copper by itself. And again, it's not Cu with a 2 next to it. I know a lot of us are going to be tempted to write Cu with a 2 there because you had a 2 here, but it's just copper. It's copper by itself. It's not Cu2. The reason it was a 2 to begin with was because it was combined with oxygen. But now it's just by itself. If you're just by yourself and you're not one of the diatomic seven, hydrogen and nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine, then you just exist by yourself as just Na or just Cu or just Al. So the Cu gets booted out, it's by itself now. That's okay, it doesn't mind being by itself. And then we need to look at it, forming a compound with Na and the O. So sodium is always Na, always plus one, and oxygen is always O, and it's always minus two. So if I were to crisscross my charges, I would end up with Na, two O. Shouldn't copper be at the back? It doesn't matter. Uh, it's kind of like a, a math question. If I wrote like 7 plus 3 is 10, or 3 plus 7 is still 10. Uh, or I could write something like 7 plus 3 is equal to 4 plus 6, or 7 plus 3 is equal to 6 plus 4. Um, it doesn't matter the order. Just like math, same in chemistry, the order just doesn't really matter. So, there you have it. Uh, when you form the compound, when you're predicting, and uh, you need to take into consideration the ion charges. You could always put it at the back to keep it the same if that's what makes sense to you or what you can kind of visualize happening, for sure. That's a great way to think about it. But in terms of kind of the, the logistics of everything, it doesn't need to be at the back. There's no requirement for it to be at the back. All right, so those are single replacement reactions. Our next one is gonna be a double replacement reaction. Let's just make sure I haven't skipped anything here. Uh, so we just did those two examples, perfect. Double replacement reaction. In a single replacement reaction, you had something that was single, and it kicked out something in the other equation, and you ended up with uh, something by itself and a compound being produced. In a double replacement reaction, you are going to have two compounds, compound one, compound two, and what's gonna happen is they're gonna switch partners and you're gonna end up with two separate compounds to finish. So it looks really similar to a single replacement reaction, but in this case, it is called a double replacement reaction, so the partners are switching. So you can see the example here is really complicated looking, uh, but we have K and CrO4, and we have another compound, Ag and NO3, and what's gonna happen is the potassium or the K is going to switch with the Ag or the silver, so you're gonna end up with K and NO3, and Ag and CrO4. So, possibly not the best example to start with, but you can maybe get an idea of what's going on here. So A and B plus D and C, again, we don't wanna end up with metal, metal, and non-metal, non-metal. So the metals are gonna switch, that's kind of the easy way to think about it, and the non-metals just maybe kind of stay where they are. Or if you want to think about the non-metals switching, that's fine as well. So another example without polyatomics, uh, Mg and Cl and Be and F, and the metals are going to switch. So the Mg is going to hang out with the F, and the 
BE is going to hang out with the CL. Kind of see how that happens. Uh, another analogy, partner swap here. You have the blue girl and the red boy, and then the, the blue girl is going to switch with the green girl. Or you can think about it in terms of shapes. Uh, whatever way works best for you to wrap your head around this, that's the way you want to think about it. So we're going to start with two compounds, we're going to end with two compounds. All right, let's look at two examples of this. Now, if you've kind of been with me so far, you probably have a pretty good idea of how this is going to kind of work. I will warn you, you don't want to end up putting two metals together or two non-metals together. So what I want to do is I want to just give you a second to kind of go through this. If you want to ask a question in chat to kind of straighten it out in your brain, that's fine. Um, but I would like you to kind of try this on your own. This is maybe a little bit more difficult than the first few we've done, but I think you guys are capable of this stuff. So your metal is going to replace your metal. Your metals are going to switch. Partner is going to stay there. See if you can do the first one, CAS and NaOH. Uh, what are you going to end up with there? If anyone wants to throw one compound into chat maybe and uh, see if others agree or disagree with you, that would probably be a good start. Does anyone want to predict what's going to happen here? Since there is three, any of them polyatomic or no. That's a really great observation. Uh, there is definitely a polyatomic happening here. So the OH, the hydroxide, the NaOH, is going to be your polyatomic. So the CA and the Na are going to switch. That's right. The OH, that polyatomic group, is going to stay together as a polyatomic group. Maybe that's where we were getting kind of caught up. So What's going to happen is the, the CA here and the NA are going to switch partners. So the CA is going to bond with the OH and the NA is going to bond with the S. We're going to always end up with two compounds if we start with two. So you're going to end up with two things here. So calcium, CA, always has a charge of plus two, always. And the CA was bonded with the S, but now it's going to switch partners. Because we don't want to end up with CA and NA. That's calcium and sodium together. That's two metals, not going to work. So we don't want that to happen. So the CA and the uh, NA are going to switch partners. So the CA is always plus two. The OH, it's a group. It's polyatomic. Page five, your data booklet. It's OH. It's hydroxide. That group always has a charge of minus one. That never changes. So it's the CA is plus two. The OH is minus one. So we can form a compound with this. There's only one way these elements will combine, and that is CaOH, and then we need to put it bracket and a two because we need two groups of that OH to combine with the one CA for the charges to balance out. So that's our first compound. The second one we have here is Na and S. There's only one way sodium and sulfur can combine and that is going to be Na with a two because we had the two here. So we need two sodiums to balance out with one sulfur. So if you think about crisscrossing that works if you think about just the charges balancing out, that'll work as well. So that is what you are going to end up with. CaOH2 and Na2S. All 
All right, this next one, again, a little bit tricky, but now that you've seen one example, uh, just going down here, I will tell you that this PO4 group of this phosphate is a, a polyatomic ion, so that group is going to stick together. How about you try this one again? And uh, if you want to throw a compound into chat, just kind of make sure you're on the right track. Do that. But you don't want to end up with two metals together, and you don't want to end up with two non-metals, so a polyatomic and a non-metal together. It's not going to work. I'm thinking you guys are going to just do this one for me. You're going to have to put in the answers. I'm just going to relax. Sit here. You guys can tell me how it's done. Anyone brave out there today? It would be really great to hear from someone we don't normally hear from. And if you're wrong, I promise I'm not going to make fun of you or anything. This is Getting started, just learning how to do these things, it's okay to make mistakes. I make mistakes all the time. Now, I've been doing this for a long time. What are we thinking? See, Ava, you don't have to worry about the like twos and threes being subscripts. If you can just get in a chat and we can see it, that'd be good. All right, let's see what we have here. Ava says Ki and Mg3PO42 with some brackets. Ava and Abby are going to agree. Does anybody disagree with that? Or are we all in agreement with what that looks like? Give you a chance to disagree. Anna agrees. We have everyone with a name that begins with A in agreement. Excellent. I know, it's kind of fun if, uh, if somebody, you know, says, no, I disagree. Taylor agrees as well. Well, if everyone agrees, well, not everyone, the vocal minority agree, then I guess we have to agree it too. There we go. Uh, all right, let's see what we can do here. So we've decided that the K and the I are going to combine together. Or you're thinking about the, the potassium and the magnesium switching places. That's essentially what's going to happen here. And we know we can only form these compounds one way. So this is where students will make mistakes. They'll write K3, I2. Well, why is that wrong? I started with K3 here, and I started with I2 here. Why do I not want to write that? What is kind of the issue with that? Is there an issue with that? Is there anything wrong with that? I've, I've swapped the K and the uh, Mg, so now I have K and I. Where's the problem? It doesn't balance the charges. That's right. So remember, when we're doing these types of problems, the potassium and the iodine, the K and the I, they can only go together one way. Even though we started with three Ks and two Is, we can't just say, okay, three Ks, two Is, and be done. We need to be able to form the compound properly. And then the next step, which we aren't doing today, just so we can get all of this stuff done, is we'd have to then balance. So that's why we balance, to make sure that the compounds, everything kind of works out. So I don't want to end up with that. What I want to do is I want to say, okay, I have potassium, that's K, and potassium always has a charge of plus one. And iodine is I, and iodine always has a charge of minus one. So if I were to balance those charges, I would end up with K and I. They're one and one. 
they balance each other out. All right, I have another compound, so I want to separate it with a plus sign. And now I'm going to have magnesium, which is Mg. Magnesium always, always, always has a charge of plus 2. And then this PO4 group. So PO4, I don't remember that one, so I'm going to go to my polyatomic ion sheet. PO4 is phosphate, always has a charge of minus 3. No exceptions. They're not multivalent. That's the only way they can combine. And I don't know if we're going to run into anything multivalent, so I might as well say it. If you have a multivalent, let's say we had like copper, which was plus one on the reactant side, copper will continue to be plus one on the product side. Uh, I know this example doesn't have that sort of trick in it, but if you have a, a multivalent metal, something that has more than one charge, if it's plus two on one side, it'll remain plus two on the other side. That's not happening here, so we don't need to worry about it, but I'm sure you will encounter it at some point. All right, I need to balance this out. So I have Mg, I need to bring the three down, and then I have PO4, and I need to bring the two down, or two groups of that. Now, if I had the time, I would balance this. I would say, okay, I have one potassium on the product side, I have three potassiums on the reactant side, I'd start to balance, go from there. But we're not balancing right now just because unfortunately we don't have all kinds of time. So that's what it's going to look like. And I believe Ava was correct and everyone agreed with her. So you guys are smart. Good job. All right, we only have a couple left. I know this is kind of tedious and a little slow today, but uh, unfortunately, we need to get through it. So there you go. Neutralization is a bit of a tricky one because we haven't talked about acids or bases yet. But in Unit 5, which I skipped, because the only sort of reference to Unit 5 from Unit 6 is this one little, little piece here, is that... Acids always begin with the letter H. They always begin with a hydrogen, and bases always end in OH. That's the definition of an acid. It starts with an H, a base, by definition, ends in an OH. So when you have an acid and a base, and you combine them together, what happens is the acid and the base neutralize each other, and you end up with salt and water. Now, so far, your encounters with salt is just table salt. That's all you know as being a salt. But salt is actually a broad category of compounds. And when you have a, a metal and a non-metal combined together, uh, generally speaking, they form a salt. There's a few exceptions. Things with oxygen sometimes don't form salts, things of that nature. But generally speaking, if you have a metal and non-metal, you stick them together, you're going to form a salt. So the salt you have in your house is sodium chloride, NaCl. That's what you put on your food. Uh, sodium chloride is just one type of salt. It's table salt everyone's kind of familiar with. But if you took a metal and a non-metal, you combine them together, they actually form what's called a salt. It's, so a salt you think is just one thing, but it's actually a broad category of things. So sulfuric acids used to um, neutralize calcium hydroxide. This all sounds quite complicated, but I assure you you've dealt with all of these things before, maybe not sulfuric acid. Uh, H2SO4 is sulfuric acid, CaOH. So it starts with an H, that means it's an acid. It ends with an OH, you get a base. So we have an acid and a base. Together, give us CaSO4 and H2O. We're going to look at where the H2O comes from here in a second, but what I can tell you is that this neutralization reaction is just a special type of double replacement reaction. It's almost completely identical, it is in fact completely identical to the previous examples we did, except it's just special because you have an acid and a base. So there's two examples here. Um, before we get to those, let's look at this. Um, this is just a, a little sheet of notes. Uh, this is not in your notes, it's just my sort of supplement to your notes. Uh, because we haven't done Unit 5, it's important to know what's going on here. So 
We're going to talk a bunch about this in unit five, but for now, if you start with an H, you are an acid. So 